All right, good, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. Um, this is the second of the two Stoll Lectures by Dr. Sachin Penda. Um, so today I'm just going to go straight into the introduction because the stores are not here. <laughs> um, so I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Sachin Penda. Um, he's, of course, the first Stoll Lecturer of this academic year. Uh, Dr. Penda is a professor and the Rita and Richard Atkinson Chair at Salk Institute. He did his PhD in the lab of Steve Kay in, uh, at the Scripps Research Institute, where he studied mechanisms regulating animal circadian rhythms. He then went on to pursue his postdoctoral fellowship working with John Hoganesh at the Genomics Institute of Novartis Research Foundation to study animal circadian timekeeping. Um, just like the um, patrons who actually supported this endowment, Tracy and Roof Store, Dr. Panda has been a trailblazer throughout his career. His research in circadian genomics in insects, in rodents, and also more recently in primates have offered a blueprint for understanding molecular, molecular mechanisms of circadian clocks. Furthermore, I think that's part, probably part of what he's going to talk about today is Dr. Penda is a pioneer in studying time-restricted eating, and his work in preclinical models and also in humans show that consistent meal times is critical to prevent or even reverse chronic diseases and to increase lifespan. So without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor to Dr. Penda. Welcome Thank again. You. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you. It's always very humbling when you have to talk about your science uh, in front of some of your scientific heroes. And Stacy Harmer is here, who was uh, a postdoc when I was a grad student in Steve's lab. And Steve's philosophy of uh, mentoring students was to talk to them about science once in six months. And in between, I would talk to postdocs in the lab, including Stacy. So. <laughs> Thank you, and thank you for inviting me. And I had wonderful interactions with all the students and trainees. Uh, you are awesome. And you are the next generation leader, so um, I had a wonderful time. Okay. So um, before we start, let's put this stuff in context. Uh, so this was published in 20. 15, I guess, um, the take home message is for every person that do help, the 10 highest grossing drugs in the United States fail to improve the condition of between 3 and 24 people. So that means the best drug you can have for any indication, whether it's cancer to even uh, acid reflux, uh, that does help only the best case scenario is 25%. So that means there is a lot of room. Um, there are two messages. One is it's not really good to be sick because the drugs are not there to cure you. And second, um, many of these drugs actually don't completely cure you. They just manage the disease. And third, perhaps combining drugs with better lifestyle may accelerate cure. And the best example is if someone has diabetes, metformin is not a free pass to go back and eat drink and do everything that you're doing before, including high carb diet, you have to combine that with better lifestyle. So that in that context, what we think is um, there is some answer from circadian rhythm because the field of circadian rhythm nicely integrates the three foundations of health, that's sleep, nutrition, and physical activity, uh, because all these three reciprocally regulate the circadian timing system. They also interact with each other, and also the circadian timing system um, is under light-dark condition, light-dark regulation. So there are many different ways we can optimize health um, by optimizing sleep, physical activity, and nutrition. So the way we look at um, health uh, in this context is health or performance is an emergent property of the system. So that means any single item, whether it's, let's see, maybe this one, okay. 
Um, any single thing, whether it's uh, better nutrition or better physical activity or better sleep, any one of them um, may give you only some benefits, but all three of them together in some combination can promote health or an imbalance between those three can also be detrimental. But the challenge is we haven't systematically looked at the influence of sleep, physical activity, and nutrition. And again, another thing is lifestyle is the quality, quantity, and timing of physical activity, nutrition, and sleep. So how do we figure out the impact of all each one of them? And we also know that sleep disruption can affect multiple organ systems, and so do nutrition and physical activity. So in the lab, what we try to do now is to optimize or perturb any one component of this and then look at uh, representative tissues from all these 10 key organ systems. So in that context, the first thing I will dive into is uh, diet because um, the nutrition field and also the disease field have gone into how nutrition affects our health. And one of the most popular model is high-fat diet-induced obesity. If you search, there are 11,000 plus papers in PubMed that describe if you put mice on high-fat diet, then they become obese, they become uh, insulin resistant, etc. Uh, but almost 15 years ago, Joe Bass's lab made a very simple but profound discovery that is still overlooked in the literature. So that is, uh, the, here the activity and uh, feeding pattern of mice on regular chow, and this is regular chow, and then this is regular chow versus high-fat diet. And if you squint your eye, you may be able to see that there is more activity and feeding during the daytime when they're not supposed to eat. And that's the quantification. So the idea is um, very simple, that on Western diet, mice actually disrupt, perturb, they break down the day-night difference in feeding. So then the question for us was how much of diet-induced obesity and all these diseases that people have modeled in 9,000 plus papers then were due to diet versus uh, how much was it due to um, timing of food. Um, so that time there was a, a grad student um, in the lab, Christopher Balmas. We did a very simple experiment. We put mice on normal chow or we fed isocaloric normal chow within an eight hours time window during the day. And the idea was to see what is the impact of feeding mice at the wrong time during the day and what fraction of the genome or transcriptome would be driven by this feeding. And um, we also did the same experiment in cryptochrome knockout mice, which do not have a functional circadian clock, to see what is the contribution of circadian clock components or having a genetic circadian clock, and also what is the contribution of feeding. So this is the summary of those experiments. Um, so C57, B6 mice, which have intact circadian rhythm, if you remove food for 24 hours completely and then sample liver every two to four hours, then you'll get nearly 370 genes that are cycling in liver. But if you just give access to ad libitum normal chow, mice eat mostly during nighttime, this number jumps to 3,000. If you give the same amount of food from the same source during daytime, then two things happen. All of the genes that are cycling here and phase to the nighttime mostly, they phase the time of peak expression changes. So that means food timing drives most of the timing of the gene expression, and also the number of rhythmic genes also improve. So that means consolidated feeding can be a strong driver or strong rhythm. But if we take cry one, cry two, double knockout mice, they have had libitum access to food, just like this mice are. They don't have a feeding rhythm you get 20 genes cycling, which is a false discovery rate. You should expect 10 to 20 genes just by false discovery rate. Also. And if you consolidate feeding, then you don't rescue 5,000 genes cycling in the liver. You get 600 genes cycling in the liver. The take-home message is having a functional circadian clock and having food consolidation improves the rhythm, the transcriptional rhythm um, in the liver. Um, so now we wanted to see, okay, so now if we go back and do the same experiment in high fat fed mice, then what happens? Um, so this is again a very simple experiment published 10 years ago. Um, we had four groups of mice, normal chow, ad libitum, normal time restricted 
and then uh, high fat ad libitum and high fat time restricted. All these four groups of mice at equivalent amount of calories throughout this 18 weeks experiment, and that's the kilocal per mouse per day, and there is no significant difference. So this is uh, 12 weeks old C57 male mice were subject to this. We have done it now in female mice. And this was 63% calories from fat. And these are some nuances that we often forget, and these uh, nuances actually affect uh, the results and how we interpret, so let pay attention to that. The activity levels in these four groups of mice did not change. Uh, there were just small changes. The time restricted fed mice were more active towards the end of their feeding phase, and whereas the early mice were more active towards the beginning of the feeding phase, the total activity was similar. This is the respiratory exchange ratio. You drive a very strong rhythm in respiratory exchange ratio under time restricted eating in normal chow or time restricted or in high fat fed mice. And this was a surprising result that although these two groups of mice had the same number of calories from the same high fat diet which has been used in at that time, 9,500 papers driving that high fat diet causes obesity. What we found is these mice were 21% uh, leaner and 67% of that reduction in body mass came from reduction in body fat. And the normal chow fed mice, uh, actually in the first week, they have little difficulty catching up with calories. So that difference kind of runs through the experiment. And those are the uh, actual pictures of the mice. So um, the conclusion from that experiment was relative to ad libitum feeding, eight hours time restricted feeding of isocaloric high fat diet at night, reduced all of these uh, factors that are described typically in high fat diet induced obesity. It increased energy expenditure, particularly oxygen consumption postprandial, not, not and during the fasting phase. Motor coordination improved and browning of brown fat also improved. The reason why this was an eight hours time restricted feeding was for no specific reason. The reason why it was eight hours was uh, Christopher's girlfriend could not let him to be in the lab for more than nine hours. Um, no, this is sometimes people always ask why. Eight? And then, you know, eight hours has become the intermittent fasting is eight hours to 16. And there's a lot of debate why you cannot do nine hours, why you cannot do seven hours. They don't understand how this was done. And the subsequent experiment, when Amandine joined the lab, she did 8, 9, 10, 12. 8, 9, and 10 have very similar outcome. 12 has less um, benefits. Okay. But the normal chow fed mice do not show a big change in weight. But what changes is, sorry, what changes is the normal chow fed mice have more muscle mass. And this is seen again and again. And um, we don't know why and if there are folks interested in how timing of nutrition affect muscle physiology, then this is a very interesting approach. At the same time, when we did this experiment, in those mice, we fed the mice during nighttime. There was a parallel paper that came out in the same week. And in this experiment, there was four hours of time restricted feeding of high fat diet, the same identical food given during daytime. And even these mice had 20% less calories. And these mice also had many benefits, but that did not reduce liver triglycerides. So that's the difference. Nighttime time restricted feeding, even with this same isocaloric diet, reduced liver triglyceride, but daytime time restricted feeding from the same identical food, even with caloric reduction, uh, sorry, no, it is not the identical food, it was 45% calories from fat, um, did not do this, did not impact that benefit. We don't know whether there's something different. We know that the 45% calories from fat, this diet has more sucrose, and um, uh, that can be pro-inflammatory. OK, so that um, concluded that we can do prevention. But then Amandine actually did more systematic studies. It took 500 plus mice and fed them in 8 to 10 hours. And even five days of time restricted feeding and two days of ad libitum feeding. And these mice, actually 5T2A, we call them, two days of ad libitum. They overeat. They consume more food than mice that eat ad libitum all seven days, but they were still protected from um, obesity. And this is the killer experiment where we pattern up the mice for 26 weeks. They are really heavy, 50 grams. And then you put them on time restricted feeding, they lose weight in the next 12, 13 weeks. These are the time restricted fed mice for almost 26 weeks. 
they're significantly different in body weight, and then you put them on ad libitum. Uh, time restriction feeding is not a learned behavior in mice. They don't learn it. If you release them, then they will go back to ad libitum eating, and they quickly gain weight. The gain in body weight, the trajectory is much faster. And again, in this time restricted fed, normal chow fed mice, uh, what was impressive was these mice had a lot of muscle mass. I don't know whether I have the slide. Okay, so I don't have the slide. And then we tried that in, um, in flies. And what we did was we wanted to see how the fly heart beats. And if you uh, take a one pixel of the fly heart image and line it up right next to each other, you get an M mode image. And from there, you can calculate uh, diastolic diameter, systolic diameter, diastolic interval, systolic interval, uh, radial contractility, heart period, and then arrhythmicity index, all of these chains in specific directions in flies and also in human heart as we get older. And the bottom line was time restricted feeding reduced this aging effect in heart, in flies. And what we also figured out in this paper was time restricted feeding was acting through proteostasis, protein folding pathway, mitochondrial pathway, and also circadian clock components were essential for this. So by this time, there are a lot of time restricted feeding papers published from all over the world. And what we're finding is there are multiple benefits, starting from improvement in sleep to increased female reproductive lifespan. There is delaying of, um, you can say, menopause in female mice. There is also increased lifespan. So many of these effects um, imply that the effect must be pleiotropic, affecting multiple organ systems. So that's why um, we wanted to see uh, what are the effects in multiple different organ systems. So Shonok and Terry um, and Amandine, they actually started this experiment. Later on, Ugo joined. We did time restriction feeding on young 12 weeks old mice. First, it was done in male mice. And we collected 22 different peripheral organs and brain regions, uh, two mice per time point per feeding condition. So you end up with nearly um, 1,000 plus samples, 1,035 passed our QC. And these are the organ systems that we collected, which represent at least one of those major organ systems, 10 major organ systems that I uh, implied. And this was done only for seven weeks of time restriction feeding because we don't want bigger changes in organ function. Uh, so we cannot disentangle what is the cause and what is the effect of time restriction eating. Of course, you will always see. So to minimize the effect, so by seven weeks, the weight difference is not too big. The, uh, so that's why we picked this time point. When we had this 12, 22 different organs, time series, two different treatments, you can slice and dice the data in many different ways. And I'm sure if once we release the data, people will use it in many different ways. And this is the overall outline of the data uh, analysis that we have done so far. Um, we want to look at what are the differentially expressed genes. Just forget about the timing. We take all the samples as replicates, and then we want to see what are the gene expression differences and which ones are common to five or more organs or which are tissue specific. And then we can also take this time series and ask what are the cycling transcripts that fit at 24 hours cosine or sine waves, and then ask what happens to rhythmic transcripts in different organ systems. So first thing, we took all the data and then this UMAP of 21,000 genes from 1,035 samples. You come up with different clusters. <clears throat> and the first thing that we wanted to see is how do these clusters represent, are represented in different organs? And one thing that pops out, uh, if you squint your eyes, you'll see that there is one cluster here in EWAT and IWAT, and they go in very different directions. So in EWAT, this cluster of genes are down-regulated in time restricted feeding. And then in IWAT, the same set of genes are up-regulated. So there will be also this, this specific change in differential expression or the direction of that differential expression. And uh, this is very important because we always describe some gene is differentially expressed in liver, and then we say it goes up, and we assume that in Similar metabolic tissue, it might be changing similarly, which may not be true. And similarly, if we dig in, we find different clusters responding differently. Then, very simple idea. 
which organs show most differential gene expression. Those organ systems may be responding more to time-restricted feeding. And um, surprisingly, pancreas is actually in the bottom quartile. <laughs> and, and the top quartile is the white adipose tissues, brown adipose tissues. And in the brain, what is surprising was many of the brain regions did not show any differential gene expression except for hypothalamus and, adren hypothalamus and then in periphery adrenal. And this is again interesting because recently there are many other exercise interventions where adrenal also shows up. Then the digestive system is the next one that shows more response to time restricted feeding. And this is kind of the combinatorial two by two um, matrix of um, gene expression differences. So you can actually uh, take any two combinations and see how many were differentially expressed and how many were common between those two tissues. Now you can ask, are there genes that always change in the same direction in multiple tissues? Maybe those can be used as kind of, you can say, marker or um, things that pleiotropically affect. And surprisingly, what we find is the hits of proteins are the ones that are differentially expressed. And this is, in retrospect now, it's not surprising because we know that time-restricted fed mice also have differences in the core body temperature regulation. This, this temperature regulation, the core body temperature cycles much robustly than at least fed mice. And then the next set of genes are mostly immune um, regulators. And again, there are a few HSPs. And then the ones that are down-regulated are the leptin. I, we always forget that leptin can be expressed in many tissues that have a little bit of fat. And in fact, it's, the transcript is detectable. So in 12 different tissues, leptin was overexpressed. And then these are the bunch of genes that are expressed in multiple tissues. So again, once the data is published, hopefully the journal will like it soon. So Then we can ask, OK, what are the common processes that are up-regulated in or down-regulated in five or more different tissues. And again, if we do um, very broad level functional annotation, what comes out is time restricted feeding actually improves the way um, the RNA protein are processed and the way uh, fatty acid is metabolized and things are degraded. That's the bottom line in a very simple way. And then the down-regulated processes are mostly oxidative stress response, um, immune response. Inflammation goes down in time restricted feeding. We have seen it in previous um, um, papers where we looked at uh, cytokines. And it was uh, gratifying to see that we see a very robust gene expression signature. And branch and amino acid degradation, and I'll get there, and glycerophospholipid metabolism. So, Branch and amino acids, uh, usually the branch and amino acids uh, should be sent to the adipose depot and should be left there. But then the branch and amino acids in many metabolic diseases, they end up circulating and accumulating in different organs. And what we're finding is in e -watt, which is this ward, now the branch and amino acid catabolic enzymes are down-regulated, oh, sorry, these are up-regulated, and then the other tissues, they're down-regulated. This is an example where it might explain uh, why uh, time restricted feeding kind of reverses that branch and amino acids are now gone there, and then they're processed there. And in parallel, we also did metabolomics, plasma metabolomics, and now we are doing tissue metabolomics to see how they, uh, um, how they match with the gene expression data. So that's just one example. Of course, there are many more examples of metabolic pathways and metabolites. I'll not go into those details. And then we asked, OK, so what, are the, what happens to rhythmic transcription? As I had shown in the mouse experiment from Christopher, time restricted feeding should increase the number of genes that are cycling in different organs. And also, it should change the amplitude and phase, et cetera. So, that's what we find under ad libitum feeding condition, nearly 40% of transcripts are cycling in at least one organ. So if you combine all this data, then we get 40% of mRNA, uh, sorry, protein coding genes that cycle. And not time-restricted feeding, nearly 60% of genes actually begin to show rhythmic transcription. 
and TRF increases gene expression rhythmicity independent of the number of differentially expressed genes in that tissue because we always think, okay, so are there correlation between the effect on differentially expressed genes versus time, uh, sorry, rhythmic genes, and um, that is not true. And here we have um, uh, interesting stuff. So what we find is many brain regions which did not show any differential expression, and now those brain regions begin to cycle. And it will be interesting to go back and see what are the processes that cycle there. And again, here we, are, we have a few, uh, a few surprises. For example, the kidney, liver, heart, they were pretty low in the differential expression, but now they have more rhythmic transcripts. In, uh, so the bottom line is, if you just look at differential expression genes, then you may not find all the differences that happen between two different interventions. If we do 24 hours um, uh, profile, then you capture more. If we combine the phase of expression of all the genes that are cycling, another big thing that we found was there is better synchrony among tissues so that um, you know, under time restricted feeding, a larger fraction of cycling genes, they are consolidated in phase and there is a large peak before feeding begins, that's the time of feeding and also large peak at the end of feeding. And this was surprising because the conventional wisdom is fasting will increase the expression of fasting-induced genes. And those fasting-induced genes should reach their peak expression level right here when feeding starts. That's when they should go down. But actually, what we find is these genes anticipate feeding is going to happen. So three to four hours before feeding happens, they begin to go down, and this is a telltale signature of circadian rhythm, this anticipatory change in gene expression and function um, that happens. Um, so again, we can go back and ask what are the genes that are common in uh, rhythmic and early feeding in multiple tissues that are common in uh, time restricted feeding and some of the usual suspects nicely, all the clock components nicely show up on the top and also some of the interesting ones, for example, V1 which is involved in uh, cell cycle regulation, NFIL3, involved in immune regulations, those ones also show up. Um, then the other thing is, we know that there are many genes that are commonly rhythmic between tissues. And they should be, and the conventional wisdom in many cases is uh, their phases should be in the right um, alignment. Uh, so if you look, for example, the ileum, these are the phase of rhythmic transcripts that are shared among different tissues, and that's the uh, chord plot showing the sharing among different tissues. And now under time ratio feeding, you can see that there are more number of genes cycling, and then the sharing is also improved. And same thing happens in heart and bat. Uh, we can do this, these chord plots for 22 organs will look too busy, so that's why I'm showing you a subset of peripheral organs, and also we have subsets of um, uh, brain tissues, they also behave that way. So there is better synchrony among different tissues under time restricted feeding, which complements what was shown by Paolo Sassanokorsi's lab a few years ago, showing that time, uh, sorry, uh, uh, high fat diet induced obesity desynchronizes rhythms among different tissues. Um, so again, we can go back and ask what are the rhythmic transcripts that are more rhythmic in TRF? that are not rhythmic in ad lib, for example. Again, we find uh, autophagy, lipid metabolism, mitochondria function. Again, we see the same RNA processing and protein folding um, are also improved. Now, we can take these gene clusters and ask what time of the day they usually peak. Under our libitum feeding condition, we actually don't see much of ketone metabolism or mitochondria genes robustly cycling, so there is no peak timing of expression, but under time, uh, time restricted feeding, these two processes become more rhythmic and they usually peak right before the feeding begins. So that's very interesting that these two emerge under time restricted feeding. And if you look at lipid synthesis and lipid catabolism, they should not happen at the same time that will lead to futile cycle. And under our libitum feeding condition, that's what happens. They overlap very uh, too much and under time restricted feeding, there is a uh, difference in phase separation. So this is, um, there is also another aspect that time restricted feeding might be temporally separating incompatible or anabolic catabolic processes slightly differently. Um, 
then you might ask, well, if we do those in GSE analysis and then ask what are the processes that are more upregulated during fasting or upregulated during feeding, all the quality control, RNA and protein quality control, are upregulated during feeding phase, and all the autophagy DNA repair, all the repair and oxidative processes are usually upregulated during the fasting phase. So as you can imagine, you can do this slicing and dicing and also combine that with metabolomics data. So this is um, time series metabolomics. Uh, we did all of this in Metabolon because we have been doing a lot of metab metabolomics previously, so we can uh, manage those data. And uh, time ratio feeding actually nicely separates the liver samples at libitum feeding on time restricted in uh, PCA plot. And here is another example of if you do time series analysis, then you can see clearly the difference in diacylglycerol uh, rhythms in the liver between ad lib and TRF. Usually um, in ad lib, for some reason, there is a very strong rhythm. We don't know why. And that may be driven by P per gamma pathway because we know that P per gamma uh, and then few other transcriptional factors actually become more rhythmic under ad libitum feeding condition and uh, under high fat diet. And um, again, so you see those differences only when you do this uh, time series analysis. So I'll not go into detail of how um, few of the glucose and glycerol pathways are affected, but what I'd like to um, pay attention, kind of draw your attention is fatty acid metabolism, because a lot of our diseases are linked to fatty acid uh, or um, dyslipidemia, and that can happen due to different defects in absorption. So that's the jejunum and ileum uh, transcripts that responding to time restricted feeding. These are all involved in fatty acid um, absorption or transport. And then liver, e -watt, and i -watt are involved in this metabolism and recycling. The bottom line is if we, uh, if we synthesize this data, what it implies is it's possible that you can improve dyslipidemia by time restricted feeding. So to address that, we put LDL receptor knockout mice on time restricted feeding. The reason why we tried LDL receptor knockout is currently, uh, for example, statins and PCSK9 um, treatment, they're all focused on LDL, functional LDL receptor. And we know that there are, uh, there are a lot of people who have um, mutations in LDL receptor and almost one in eight people who don't respond to statin therapy have that mutation. And they will not respond to statin, they will not res respond to PCSK9 because those depend on LDL receptor. So when you put the high, um, this um, LDL receptor knockout mice on high fat, high cholesterol diet, we do see similar stuff. Time restricted feeding prevents weight gain even with this uh, uh, same caloric intake. And we actually see very significant reduction in VLDL and IDL or LDL particle composition in this mice. There is a significant reduction in uh, serum cholesterol and serum triglyceride. And we see almost 34% reduction in plaques in this aortic arch. And um, this is quite exciting for us because now, hopefully, this will open up a new uh, lifestyle intervention on people who are resistant to statin therapy. And so I'll change um, gear here, and I'll talk to you about something that we try to do with um, firefighters. Shift workers are um, highly susceptible to cardiometabolic disease because of the shift work. And we did a randomized control trial um, where we had all participants follow Mediterranean diet, and then the half of the participants uh, did Mediterranean diet plus 10 hours time restricted eating. And the idea was can firefighters, so do 24 hour shift, adopt time restricted feeding, and if they do, then what happens? Um, so I don't know whether we have time. Um, when I'm in the fire to. station, my heart rate, resting heart rate goes up just being in a fire station. Our schedule is completely different than any other schedule. For the fire department, you are always in a heightened state of awareness. Over the course of a career, you know, it can really tax your body and your mind. And as a consequence of their lifestyle, 45% of on-job deaths of firefighters is attributed to cardiovascular disease. No one really talks to you about 
the physiological and psychological effects that, that has on you. I pray that I can always fulfill my duty. I took an oath to do that. Firefighters are a really interesting group of individuals, but they still have really early onset cardiometabolic diseases because they have such a strenuous schedule. Started looking for new ways and new research to see how we could affect our health. We have to be very, very aggressive in what we do, the research, the information. Is there a way that we could use what we've learned in circadian biology and see if we can improve firefighter health just by making small changes in lifestyle? Firefighters in general are always looking for ways of improving their overall health, whether it's physical or mental. Because what we do for a living is detrimental to our health. If it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. We gotta go back to the drawing board, but I really think there's a good shot at it working. When I'm in the oh. fire station, oh. my heart. Okay, so the trial was very simple. They had to do this time, 10 hour time restricting for 12 weeks and we put CGM, uh, they used our app for remote delivery of uh, lifestyle intervention. And um, um, at the end of these 12 weeks, they came back and then we have the six months, nine months, and 12 months follow-up that will come out uh, hopefully in the future. Uh, so these are the three ways we kind of monitor and deliver the intervention. And we get the streams of data where we have their food, their CGM, their activity, and their light exposure. All of these data streams coming in. And um, the bottom line is this is, their, this is their eating pattern at baseline uh, for standard of care group. So each concentric circle shows food eaten by one firefighter over two weeks interval. And you can see they start around, say, 6 o'clock. Many of them end around 8 or 10, but there is a little bit of snacking in the middle of the night. And at the end of three months, the standard of care group did not actually change that habit too much. And um, these are the um, time restricted fed group. And these are the meals that were happening outside the intended 10 hours time restricted eating at baseline and they could reduce their eating um, and restrict that to 10 hours. And this was very pleasing, very gratifying to see that because we did not think that firefighters who are doing this 24-hour shift can do that. And we didn't see any complaint from the fire, fire department about the response to 911 call or how long that took to reach the site or the level of their service. And due to the Unions um, mandate we could not select only firefighters with disease because that would do, lead to on-job discrimination. So anyone who was willing to participate in our study was allowed to participate. So, uh, but at the same time, we found that nearly uh, 70, sorry, 85 percent of firefighters who were in our study had at least one of these risk factors. Um, uh, although not the same ones had multiple risk factors. Uh, so this is the overall result that, that just came out this morning, and we're pleased that cell metabolism also had the cover act of a firefighter on the top. And uh, they could reduce, significantly reduce the eating interval. We don't see, since it was an almost healthy cohort, you should not expect to see too much differences because they're starting from a healthy level. They will, they will not become super healthy. But if you take firefighters who had high fasting blood glucose, high HbA1c, high insulin, homoia, or systolic diastolic blood pressure or LDL cholesterol, then you'll see that many of these cardiometabolic risk factors improve in those who had the risk. So those who are healthy, they continue to be healthy. It did not adversely affect their health, but those who were unhealthy, they became healthy. So in the last four or five minutes, um, I'll try to tell you a completely new story. So we always talk about how sleep disruption affects health, nutrition, overnutrition, caloric restriction, time restriction, et cetera. People are studying how physical activity affects your health. But nearly 40% of athletes and a good number of college students and young adults, what they do is they exercise more and eat less. And we know that there are a lot of uh, adverse impact of that. And uh, we wanted to study that. But in that context, I'll allude it to something else. That is, what is the, what, uh, in circadian rhythm, the holy grail has been, what is the difference between diurnal and nocturnal species? Why diurnality evolved or why nocturnality evolved? And Rolla Fort, who works in Netherlands, came up with this 
simple idea that maybe the energy deficit is the way animals became day active because night light, nighttime temperature is pretty low. So if animals are more active during daytime, they can sleep at night and that will conserve energy. So what he does is he puts this, he designed these cages where uh, the amount of revolution, the amount of wheel running is linked to food delivery. So progressively he can increase how many number of wheel running they have to do before they get a pellet of food. And it, when it does that, these mice, this is the body temperature in red and blue, and that's the activity pattern. And in few days, these mice become day active, and the core body temperature can drop as low as 21 degree, and uh, they kind of prefer to sleep at night instead of daytime. And uh, so that's where the energy expenditure also goes down. There are many species of mice and also common voles and tundra voles that uh, can respond to this work for food program. Uh, but the birds, I don't know how they did the experiments <laughs> who are diurnal, they don't respond to it. Um, but at the same time, as I, uh, as I told you, there is this concept called relative energy deficiency in sports. And this is very similar where these athletes, they exercise more and eat less. And that leads to many health effects and also many performance effects, adverse effects. Um, and these are the difference between, or similarity between work for food uh, program in mice and redness in humans. So we think that this particular model can help us to understand what happens to our physiology and metabolism and gene expression, et cetera, when we exercise more and eat less. And so here's the simple experiment. We subjected both male and female mice, and their workload increases. So this is the amount of work they have to do to eat. The total activity actually doesn't change over this time. And the cumulative energy intake goes down. Um, so their body mass also, they lose a little bit of weight towards the end of the experiment. The female mice are more resistant to body weight loss, whereas the male mice actually lose a lot of body weight. And this is the activity pattern. And you know, today, we talked about activity pattern in mice. And we know that female mice, they work more voluntary wheel running activities much more. Male mice work less. They also take a siesta. And the idea is the total activity between these two groups are very similar. At the end of the experiment, we take this mice, and we, the first thing you can do is, when you open up the mice, you can clearly see there are differences in organ weights, and particularly, we're surprised to see that the kidney and um, here the, actually in female mice, the uterus just shrinks. And um, so that's the first thing that you can see. And as I mentioned, we want to repair, sample every type of tissue. So in this case, uh, Laura actually samples quite a few different brain regions because her idea is also to see in which part of the brain the phase of the circadian clock is changing. And maybe that will give a clue to where is the diurnality nocturnality switch. And for me, uh, the idea is what happens to the physiology and metabolism. And actually, we have expanded this. Now we have done male, female, and also more uh, tissue types. And we do very careful dissections, which are very similar to what the mouse brain methylome project is doing at SOLC. So we follow the same um, uh, guidelines and dissection technique. And I'll just uh, give you the gist of that. Uh, so what is interesting is, as I said, uterus was the organ that was shrinking in female. And the maximum gene expression differences we are seeing is in the uterus. And then, of course, the TA and non-TA, um, all these muscle tissues also show some effect in male and female mice. But you're super excited about the brain, because what we see is the Nocturnal, we, Laura calls them the diurnal mouse and nocturnal mouse. Diurnal mouse are the high workload mice. So they have a very different set of cycling genes in almost every organ than the nocturnal mice. And the common are very small. And then if we look at the differentially expressed genes, to a great surprise, it was not any hypothalamic region, but habenula is the one that responds the most to this high workload and low workload. And this kind of, there was an aha moment because we know that reds, red S, one of the features is these athletes, 
uh, experience multiple bouts of depression and anxiety, we always think that this is related to that competitiveness because they're always curious, they're always anxious that they may lose the next game or what if they cannot perform. And the habenula is also shown to play a big role in treatment resistant depression. And habenula is also the region that responds to ketamine um, treatment that reduces depression. So we are super excited about habenula, but it's a very complex structure in terms of cell types. So we may have to go back and do cell type specific single nuclei sequencing to see what is changing. And with that, I'll stop and acknowledge the hard work from many past members whose work I summarized and current members. And these are the uh, funding agencies. And also this is my disclosure. Thank you. Yeah, that's a tricky question to address. I Means I can do the experiment and come up with some differences. But what happens is when you feed mice during daytime or change this, uh, there is also disruption of sleep. Uh, so how do I account for that sleep disruption? We haven't figured out how to um, factor that in. So that's why we kind of stuck to this model. Although there are other labs who try to do time restricted feeding during daytime and say the benefits are less, so this is mistiming of the clock. But the bottom line is there is a lot of sleep disruption when you feed mice during daytime. And um, this bimodal peak, um, this is this is also a signature we found in fly time restricted feeding experiments when we did uh, head, body, and heart transcriptome. And a baboon transcriptome is actually from baboons who are inadvertently on time-restricted feeding. And we also see those two clear peaks in anticipation of feeding and also anticipation of sleep. I think there's a question at the back. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess um, you know only the male mice are kind of crepuscular because they take nap, and the female mice are not don't have that uh, difference. Um, so we're repeating all these experiments in female mice, and we have the data. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what are the male female differences. Um, but coming back to your comment about uh, corticosterone um, plasma, we are kind of currently analyzing the plasma samples. And we did both the male female mice together, uh, the plasma analysis, and then we realized that the female mice were in different phases of the astrocycle, sorry, yeah, astrocycle, so we have to deconvolute that. Uh, but we'll keep that in mind to see how to better interpret that result. Thank you. Keith? Yeah, so the model here is, um, let's see. Yeah, so this is the low workload. So that means 
they just have to almost walk in the park to get food. So they just have to get on the wheel. And if I go back to the actual uh, jewel or the meter they have to work, uh, walk, that's very low. Um, so that's, the, that's our control group we are comparing against. So these are actually at Libitum running too. So the, um, the number of kilometers they ran in 20 days is here. They ran around 280 kilometers in 20 days. We're not increasing resistance. They're just, um, we're not increasing resistance of the wheels. Uh, what they're doing is they, um, this ad libitum group is running, say, 50 revolution before they get food. And then the other group, um, the second day they have to run 55, then the next day 60 or 70. So that's how we are increasing the number of revolutions they have to run. But the resistance on the wheel remains the same throughout the experiment and between. Um, I have a question about uh, mice that are uh, adapted to high latitudes versus uh, equator, uh, sort of a plant-related question that I know uh, Stacy would be asking. Um, <laughs> is there is there a difference in the clock and their ability to adapt, or have it, has that even been looked at? Yeah, so the hypoxia model, that's the hypoxia model. I mean, you reduce the oxygen concentration, that's what you're asking? At high altitude, that's... No, latitude. No? latitude. Oh, latitude, okay. Um, so the light dark uh, cycle is different. So we haven't done much in that area. Um, other people do like six hours light, 18 hours dark, and vice versa. We are not doing those kind of experiments. I have a question about your firefighter study. So you said your, I think what you showed us were data from about 12 weeks out. Yeah. But, but you said you were did longer term studies, six months or maybe longer. What's the compliance like when you when you go months out after the after? Yeah, so you... the three months was uh, intensive contact with them, and then from three months to twelve months, they are almost free living, um, but only <clears throat> for one random week in a month, we'd ask them to log their food, and uh, I think at six months and nine months and 12 months, we also went to the fire station and put active watch and the CGM on them. Uh, so it will be interesting to see what is the compliance. Um, but what we see among general population is the compliance among people with metabolic syndrome is around 70% uh, at one year. Again, the same design, uh, 12 weeks of intensive intervention and then the almost allowed to free living condition, they have to self-regulate. Um, they have the option to continue using the app because through the app we occasionally send a few blogs or nudges, um, but that's typically our observation that 67, 70% comply with metabolic syndrome. Yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see with people that are healthy to begin with how it yeah. turns out. I think we can take maybe one more question. Anybody else? Nope. Okay. All right. We'll go do some time if you're free. No. Yeah, exactly. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Sachin. Thank you for coming. Thank you.